everyone. Welcome back to Housing Assembly 2021. I hope you managed to have a bite to eat and a bit of a break. Uh, please continue to share your thoughts with us and any resources you might like to share. And if you want to leave a comment or ask a question, check out the chat button or the question button. And you can all vote for the questions you would like answered by clicking the heart against the question. Yes, we want you to share some love as well for the questions anyway. And our next section session is about to begin and it's on housing regulation for disability housing. It's hosted by Dr. Andrew Martell, lecturer in architecture and construction management in the Faculty of Architecture, Building and Planning at the University of Melbourne. Over to you, Andrew. Thank you, Karen. Um, welcome everybody um, to this afternoon session. Uh, we're really pleased that you could join us. Uh, I'd just like to start by acknowledging the traditional owners of the possibly very many lands um, that people are tuning into today, but in particular, to the, the Kulin Nation, uh, whose lands we're on here at the University of Melbourne. Um, so we really very much like um, this to be a discussion, um, <clears throat> fairly free flowing, but what we thought we would do is just to begin with, run through the framework of this session is really around the current research project that we're doing here at the University of Melbourne. And so I wanted to walk you through very quickly the, the parameters of that research project, and that will allow us, I think, to uh, have a nice, lively discussion this afternoon. So you'll hear from me a little bit. This is introduction, and then from Owen, following Owen, Vital, and then from Philip. Can move to the next slide. That would be great. Thank you. Oh, back one. Uh, so... <laughs> No, you're right. That was me getting it wrong. There we go. So look, just to have a little bit of context, the, the discussion today is about regulation. It's really about concerns around uh, the provision of housing for people with disabilities here in Australia. And so just as a little context around that, the introduction of the NDIS has had a really profound effect on the delivery of housing for people with disabilities in Australia. Um, there are two main areas of that. One has been really the emphasis on people living in the community, wherever they want in the community, not being stuck um, into um, having to go to a particular government facility, but be able to choose where they live. And the other really big change has been that's related to that is really the seen as the private sector as the driver of supply, not the government sector, which was the case in the past. So those changes have really been big in the sector. In addition to that, there's a really complex relationship between home and work, which I think we've all sort of gotten used to a little bit with the COVID situation, but it's particularly the case for people with disabilities who will often have people come into their home to work and who work from home um, as much or possibly more than people without disabilities. And the other thing I just to sort of say with the context is that housing is a regulated industry and housing for people with disabilities has additional regulation over on top of that. So it's quite a regulated uh, ecosystem. Okay. Good. Next one, please. Thank you. So what regulation impacts on people um, providing housing for people with disabilities? Clearly building regulations, the, the Building Code of Australia, the NCC, um, which apply to all buildings, they have an impact and we'll talk a little bit about that today. Disability specific regulations have an impact primarily delivered through the NDIS that has both a housing and a service sort of element to it. Tenancy regulations, a lot of people with a disability are, are renters as well as owner occupiers and so rent tenancy regulations uh, impact. Um, and we have human rights regulations, which again we'll talk a little bit about today, that Australia has is a signatory to human rights regulations, and so those regulations also have an impact on housing for people with a disability. Um, if we go to the next one. Thank you. So what this project's about, what we think is our novel contribution here, and what we sort of hope the conversation today will be around is that we know that Australia is a signatory to the UN Convention on the Rights of People with a Disability. As we mentioned before, changes brought about by the NDIS have changed the Residential Tenancies Act, part of that revamp of the Residential Tenancies Act, not all of it, but part of it in Victoria, acknowledged that there was specific disability housing, not so in the other states yet. So we're really interested in how concerns around human rights and tenancy rights for people how are they reflected practically in the National Construction Code, which in itself doesn't even have a definition of disability in that code. And so ultimately what we're trying to do is understand the role of the NCC in facilitating affordable and safe housing for people with disabilities. 
of thank you. So what are we trying to do? Well, we're trying to unpick the variety of legal responsibilities around construction, rights and tenancy and see where they support or they inhibit investment in new dwellings uh, to accommodate people. We're trying to work out which set of responsibilities has a legal precedence over the others. And so that can be used as sort of an overarching guide about what are we intending to do with housing for people with disabilities. And <clears throat> the other thing we're trying to do is to try and work out, well, what could be done and by who to sort of clarify what's very uncertain sort of governance environment around this housing sector so that we can facilitate private um, investment into the sector, into really much needed into the sector. Uh, next one, please. So finally, for me, sort of what are we hoping to get out of the project? Well, we're really hoping to shed some light on the really complex interaction between rights-based and performance-based policy here in Australia that influence quality and cost of new houses. We're trying to provide a practical point of reference for sort of new entrants into the market and clearly to, oops, clearly to influence um, future policy directions by government. And one of the reasons that we're here today uh, and that we're holding some roundtable events uh, tomorrow and Friday is because we really see this as an opportunity for peer-to-peer -peer engagement with stakeholders from a whole range of areas, government, development, law, not-for-profit, to actually talk to each other and try and work out how we go forward in that. So that's what we're trying to do. Hopefully we'll have a discussion around that today that we'll, and we'll get some feedback from you guys uh, out in the audience. So first up, we're going to hear from Owen. And so uh, I invite Owen to, to come on and speak to us. Thanks, Andrew, for the, for the introduction. And hi, everyone. Look, thank you so much for your time. What I wanted to do today was set the scene for uh, development of disability housing, some of the challenges uh, that developers are currently facing uh, so um, developing property is risky, um, due to, but it's even more so for developing disability housing due to, to complex and sometimes conflicting and sometimes unclear regulation. Um, this lack of clarity is, is leading to mistakes that we're seeing happening by developers in the sector at the moment, which is very unhelpful. We, we, we want to see everyone succeed with their developments of disability housing. And for some, it's certainly putting in place a barrier for development, which we don't want. We want to see a flourishing new disability housing sector. And as Andrew said, funded, funded by private investment. Um, to set the scene a little bit, if I'm just to name some of the codes, standards and uh, regulations that we need to comply with, Andrew mentioned a very important one, the National Construction Code. We've got a suite of Australian standards that are very specific to disability housing development, some around access, some around fire protection. We've got complexity in uh, the uh, planning re uh, regulatory environment in each state, which varies by state. We've got SDA design standards. If we're designing and developing SDA under the, uh, the uh, uh, governance of the NDIS, we've got tenancy legislation requirements, we've got workplace safety. All of these um, regulations developed over time don't necessarily work effectively together. And, uh, and that's something that we, I guess we'd like to kind of unpick and find uh, you know, where, the, where the gaps are where the overlaps are, where the potential conflicts are through the, through the project. A very important piece of, of regulation is, as Andrew said, the National Construction Code. And what we're seeing at the moment is really very different interpretations of the National Construction Code by building certifiers. So we're seeing um, wide ranging qualities of builds, pre uh, predominantly due to different classifications given to uh, disability housing, be it SDA housing, specialist disability accommodation, or non-SDA disability housing. The interpretations across um, regions vary quite a lot. And, and what this is doing is seeing a very wide divergence in the cost of construction, with some uh, constructions being quite a lot more expensive than developers may originally have anticipated due to the, the extra, I guess, uh, compliance that comes with different classes of building. Um, so some projects are, are being deemed financially unviable and it, and it could be argued that, that it's because of um, over-engineering, because of interpretations of the NCC enforcing requirements that are not particularly home-like. They might be uh, more akin to a facility or an institutional environment and that's pushing up the complexity of the pr project, pushing up the price and, ma and making projects unviable and actually not going ahead. Um, 
we're also seeing, oh, actually, I might ask for a slide to be shown on that note as an example of, of, of a real project where, where th this is potentially the case. So on the screen now, you'll see a one resident, one bedroom, uh, open plan living, modular dwelling. It's an SDA dwelling. That dwelling, when it was installed on the site uh, for one resident and carers with a unit next door was deemed under the National Construction Code by the building certifier as class three. Now with class three dwellings comes a whole host of uh, requirements, one of which is an accessible parking space. So you'll see here, this is the actual building in, installed in situ with an accessible parking space for the one resident who lives in this dwelling and that's in their carport. That's, that was the outcome of this interpretation of the NCC for this particular building. And I guess it just highlights where we might be in some cases inadvertently over-engineering buildings, increasing cost, and certainly not creating this very much home-like environment that we would like. Thanks for the slide. We can close that now. Now, some, we're seeing some projects go to the other extreme where interpretations of the NCC are such that there's potentially no safeguards in place where a dwelling with multiple residents with disability who require assistance to evacuate in the event of a fire don't have safeguards in place very much at all. Uh, the safeguards that we might have thought were a good thing like fire sprinklers are not being installed. And, and it's the other extreme where, where residents might be placed at risk. And because of the lack of clarity with the NCC, with no definition of disability within NCC, we're seeing some of these problems emerge. Um, so, so I guess one of the things that, that we'd, I'd like to see is a review of the NCC in the near future to try and iron out these, these inconsistencies. And this project's really helpful for getting your feedback to explore what you see as issues at the moment, because it is a very, very complex environment. In addition, in, in addition to maybe uh, interpretation issues with the NCC, we also see other areas of legislation that don't necessarily work uh, consistently together. And we see them uh, developed in isolation of each other, things like um, tenancy law, as Andrew mentioned, things like planning law, we see uh, tax law, and, and not only do they not necessarily work together well, they are also vary by state. So some of the, this regulation, because it varies by state, really puts in place some barriers for developers to work nationally providing a national consistent approach to the products that they, they would like to de develop. What we also see is, um, excuse me, sorry, um, regulation that needs to take into account the human rights, the, the rights of the resident and what they would like. What we really don't want to be developing is, I guess, what we saw in the past, which might have been a mini institutional environment with uh, large group homes. And, and the regulation really needs to support a more uh, dignified, mainstream uh, living environment. Um, until we get these consistency across all the states, until we can get rid of some of the silos of legislation that don't work well together, um, we're going to continue, continue to see barriers for development. And we, I guess we'd like to see a much more flourishing market developing disability housing, which we're not quite there yet. And, and so, so the, the regulatory environment is something that that needs uh, quite a bit more work. That was all I had to say from the perspective of a developer and might pass back now to Andrew and uh, to Vital. Thank you, Owen. Um, thank you. Um, so the next um, person on our panel to talk will be uh, Vital. Over to you, Vital. Um, thanks, Andrew. Um, thanks, Owen, for that. Um, I mean, picking up from where Owen left off, um, as you said, there is a bit of um, complexity around um, um, housing, particularly for people with um, disability. Just broadly, while we have regulation that um, govern residential housing, there is further additional requirements that um, needs to be inputted for disability housing. So I'll just give you a brief overview of um, what we have in the National Construction Code, which is the NCC, and how that sort of um, informed um, housing for people with disability. So as um, Owen just said about the inconsistency about, around the regulation across different states, um, we have the NCC, which is a national document, which sort of um, 
set design and construction requirement um, for various buildings, as well as non other habitable and structures as well. Um, the NCC fundamentally um, provides um, a, a minimum necessary requirement for sort of safety, health, um, accessibility, sustainability um, in regards to design and construction, as well as um, performance of um, these um, structures. So um, in sort of um, coming up with the NCC, the NCC is, is being informed and um, looking at um, um, human rights and tenancy rights as um, Owen just um, highlighted, that's informed um, the NCC and then that's sort of um, feed down to developing housing for people with disability. Now the NCC itself um, is a performance-based code, which means um, it's sort of open for interpretation um, by various interpretation. And that could um, um, yield them um, sort of chaos because different practitioners can interpret it differently. Now, within the NCC, we have what we refer to as, or we, we call them building classification. So building classification is used to determine um, the class of the building based on the purpose for which the building is being designed, constructed, and as well as the purpose for which it will be used at the end of construction. Now, within the NCC, we've got um, 10 different classification. Class one, classes one to nine um, covers um, habitable structures, um, which um, um, involve or include some um, residential commercial buildings which are habitable. And then in class 10, we have what we refer to as non-habitable um, structures like um, sheds, um, carport, as well as other structures like retaining walls and masts, um, which is covered in class 10. Now, generally speaking, just to bring into context for you, um, most of us will live probably in a detached house or a standalone house or a townhouse or a unit, which is normally um, classified as a class one um, or class one A um, building under the NCC. And then we have um, class two um, building, which is um, similar to like what you have like in an apartment block. Uh, an apartment um, structure that is classified as a class two because of how um, it's been structured and the requirement for it. And we also have um, class three, as which I just mentioned, where we have a um, um, residential building for long-term um, um, purpose or long-term accommodation. So that includes things like um, hostel or a boarding home or um, backpack accommodation as it's been defined um, within the NCC. And within this particular class, where you have um, sort of um, long-term accommodation, that is where the NCC sort of um, categorize or mention where housing for people with disability um, um, belongs. So the problem with that is um, it's because it's classified in a class three and as a, as a long-term accommodation, that can bring a lot of downstream problem when it's it's being developed or design um, over design, and that can be an issue with cost as well as issue with quality. Now, in looking at that, since the the NCC only sort of classify housing for people with disability in a class three, um, that means you need to have addition. It has implication because in a class three building, class three. Um, structures or class three building are sort of um, commercially operated, which means when they're commercially operated, they need to have specific requirements. And in saying that as well, in addition to that, um, for a builder to construct a class three building, normally you need to have a commercial license as part of um, the, 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 the standard um, um, in Australia. So now looking at the implications of having um, housing for, for people with disability in a class three, you need to have um, internal fire ratings, for example, which you not have in a class one building, which most of us will live in. Or you need to have um, emergency um, exit requirement. You need to have um, um, a bollard, like um, the one um, Owen showed in the previous slide. You need to have sprinklers requirement. You need to have um, acoustic separation between um, habitable spaces. And that can, can, can impact the cost. It, it can impact um, as well as um, the quality of um, the inhabitants living in those spaces. So I must I say that um, while the NCC itself does um, sort of address um, access for people with disability, it does not, however, address the problem that's related to building classification because the building classification sort of affects the, 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 the overall design, which can be over-designed and then that can be costly 
and it's as so said cannot be viable and as well addressing access in the ncc does not sort of address the fire related issue that you have to deal with because when you have a class three building you then have to have all these fire separation issues that needs to be taken into consideration making it um, quite um, expensive so we'll, as part of these projects we we'll think that it's it's necessary or required for housing for people with disability to be sort of properly classified um within the ncc and sort of that will make it a bit more equitable reduce cost and at the same time that is um, most likely going to improve um, quality for um, the inhabitants and that's all um, 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 I, I have to say as part of um, the MCC um, and yeah, um, Andrew over to you. Thank you Vital okay. and so um, now we'll move on to our next speaker who is Philip. Thank you Andrew and uh, thank you everyone. Um, Andrew, Owen and Vital have talked about the various uh, legislative and regulatory instruments which might impact upon disability housing and have made some comments about how they exist in silos and the like and how that fact can um, complicate the understanding of what is required in relation to disability housing. I'm, I'm going to make some comments about why um, we might find ourselves in this situation, how it has come about that we have these silos and, and how we might move forward so that um, the question of the delivery of disability housing is more efficiently addressed by the community. Um, I think it's helpful to remember that a number of the regulatory instruments which impact upon disability housing have been with us for a long time. And when they were first drafted, uh, there was no thought given to um, how to best accommodate people um, with particular needs. The building regulatory world, for example, I mean, building regulations were originally a matter of the, um, the tailoring of individual municipal councils in Victoria. Um, they were then brought together in the uniform building regulations, which then morphed into the Victoria building regulations and ultimately morphed into the, the National Construction Code. And through all of that evolutionary process, there was really no input um, from the perspective of uh, people who might have particular needs. Um, the focus of that exercise and that evolution was um, the quality of the physical product in terms of safety and health and amenity, but not so much uh, what might be needed for appropriate living accommodation for people with disabilities. Um, another complicating factor in relation to the NCC, the National Construction Code, is um, uh, the fact that we're a federation, and this is a, com a complicating factor often in matters of trying to create efficiency and national uniformity. But um, each state has adopted the National Construction Code with a view to introducing uniform standards throughout Australia. Um, notwithstanding that each state has adopted the National Construction Code, uh, there is the provision within the code for each state to have their own um, departures from the code. And over time, those departures can build up to be quite significant. The building classification, which Vidal mentioned, is um, still uniform around Australia. But the way in which uh, building surveyors or whoever is responsible for classifying builders in each particular jurisdiction, and in Victoria, it's private building surveyors, but in other jurisdictions, it can be different. Um, the way in which they interpret and apply those building classifications is um, highly varied. Uh, we heard Owen talk about that, and that can create um, complexity. The fact that the national code is a national code means that any changes to the code um, can take a long time to come to fruition. The um, advisory body which informs governments about what changes might be made to the code does not only consist of uh, the various state governments, but it consists of other national organisations representing various participants in the construction industry. So there is a good deal of consultation, which is not a bad thing, but it takes time. There's a good deal of consultation which takes place about any amendment to the national code. Uh, and once that advisory body might come to a uniform landing about um, the amendments which might be required, it then has to go through uh, the more formal bureaucratic structures to bring those amendments about. So all of that can take time. And historically, there has been no 
um, input into that process representing the perspective of people with particular needs. Uh, and there is still currently no um, formal participation in that process, in that advisory body of anybody representing the people with special needs. So in the, um, in the building regulatory world, there has been and there is still no tight connection between um, those who might craft amendments to those regulations and those people with special needs. And I think that if there was a tighter connection between those um, two interests, then we would see um, a sharper focus in the building regulations on the needs of people with disabilities and also perhaps a more efficient way of bringing about the amendments which might be required. Similar comments can be made about the planning um, regime. I mean, the planning regime was not born in an environment um, in which uh, the thought, any thought was given to accommodating people with special needs. And um, the planning regime is, as the building regime was many decades ago, um, is, is not a national regime. Uh, it is not even a uniform regime in, um, in Victoria. I mean, we have uh, a state overlay, if you like, but there is still um, significant capacity for different municipalities to have um, different provisions in relation to their planning regimes. So there can be even less uniformity in the planning world than there is in the, uh, in the building world. And um, if there is to be changes made to the planning regime to better support disability housing, um, at the moment, uh, it would be uh, difficult to bring those changes about on a uniform basis. We have more recent um, developments which impact upon uh, those with special needs. We've got uh, the United Nations Convention, um, which uh, Andrew referred to earlier. We've got discrimination um, legislation. We've got um, a greater focus on human rights. We've got the Charter of Human Rights in Victoria. Now, a number of those documents, um, some of them are specifically directed towards um, addressing the interests of people with special needs. Some of them do it a little more obliquely. And then, of course, we've got the NDIS. And the NDIS is probably the most significant um, recent development and probably the most powerful catalyst for bringing about change. And if you look at the NDIS and what it says about housing and accommodation for people with disabilities that the NDIS is prepared to fund, it has um, you know, quite some detailed requirements as to what that accommodation should look like, what criteria it should satisfy. But those requirements have not necessarily been specified with an eye to what the National Construction Code says. Um, and so you've got um, detailed criteria, detailed requirements in relation to physical accommodation in two different places, the NDIS requirements, the National Construction Code, and they have not been um, drafted with a perspective of how each of them are addressing um, the particular requirements. And that lack of uh, uniformity or lack of um, cooperation between the bodies that are preparing those documents um, means that we don't have uh, sufficient uniformity between those documents at the moment, and we don't have a mechanism to, to generate that um, uniformity. And what the mechanism might be to generate uh, uniformity, clarity, simplicity and efficiency is one of the things which uh, we hope to explore as part of the research project um, that we have underway. What is the mechanism? What uh, thinking should inform that mechanism? Um, one thought I have, which um, people might ponder and might uh, we might discuss in the roundtables um, over the next two days, is perhaps there ought to be a pointed at a national level with state representation as well, a body whose sole purpose is to uh, look after the interests of people with special needs in this context. We have that now in certain contexts. We have particular bodies appointed to look after the human rights of uh, people with particular challenges and the like. Perhaps we need someone who's a body whose sole task is to look after the accommodation needs or, or think about the accommodation needs of people with disabilities and to build relationships with each of the current regulatory bodies which impact upon that exercise um, and, and to be the, the catalyst which brings all of those bodies together so that we have 
um, each of the regulatory bodies talking to each other, understanding what perhaps might be regarded as the primary responsibility of those regulatory bodies, or at least the historical responsibility of those regulatory bodies, and help um, those regulatory bodies have at the front of their mind when they're going about their task, um, the perspective of people with disabilities. Now, that will be no small task. There's a number of uh, bodies to bring together. There's a number of interest groups um, that have a stake in that. Uh, there's the historical bureaucratic machinery. Um, there's the, um, the lingering difficulties that can arise um, because of our federation and the way in which different states, even if they have a, a uniform aspiration, can go about seeking to um, implement um, or deliver upon that aspiration. So it's a, it's, it's, it's a significant task that lies in front of us and one which we hope this research project will make a relevant contribution to. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you, Philip. Okay, so I think we're going to go back to all of us on the screen. We really encourage, uh, if there's any questions out there in the audience, um, we're more than happy to try and answer those. Those will, if you put those up, they'll come through to me and uh, I will ask them. But maybe um, in the meantime, to, to get us going, uh, maybe a question to you, Owen. Uh, just um, maybe some background for us. What what do you see as the sort of the current momentum behind building of um, SDA and other housing provisions for people with disabilities at the moment, in, in Victoria in particular? Is it, how's it going as part of the housing sector? It's a good question, Andrew. Thank you. Um, th there's a lot of interest. There's definitely a lot of interest. Um, it's been five years now since the NDI uh, commenced in 2016. And we've seen an, a, a, a peak of interest in disability housing net and then a slight waning as the complexity of the environment sort of becomes, uh, I, I guess, better understood. So, so this project is really important to, throw, I guess, uh, to break down some of those barriers uh, that, that are there for development. Now, there's others, don't get me wrong, this is not the only one, but, but it's, a, it's a really important one. So I, I really hope the exploration of the issues, the, the, the work that might follow on from this research project will help to work at least on that regulatory environment for developers to make it more consistent, better better understood. Um, I mean, there comes risk. When, when there's unknowns, there's risk. And, and, and it's already very risky developing. So the, 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 the more we can mitigate that risk, you know, we're seeing mistakes being made now by developers, really costly mistakes, building projects which then are non-compliant, you know, with SDA requirements or non-compliant with the National Construction Code. And, and, and nobody wants to see that. So I think we, we're on, we, we've got the interest, but we want to keep that interest in the sector. Thanks, Owen. Um, I've just had a question come through from Alex um, <coughs> to, to, for Philip, and I think it picks up on what you were saying, Philip, about um, how slow building regulations and those things move and, you know, the, the processes. But Alex's question was, which organisation, government or otherwise, uh, do you think is best place to um, to drive the mechanism for reform that you think is required? Well, I, I think um, I'll give my answer in the first instance in a Victorian context because I'm most familiar with the the structure of the bureaucracy in Victoria, if you like. But I think it ought to be, if, if we're looking at government, and I think it needs to be a government and perhaps a, a private sector organisation, there needs to be those two organisations coming together somehow. In the government context, I think it's, um, in the Department of um, Human Services is where uh, there ought to be um, the centre, if you like, of focus on this, which then branches out and links with other limbs of government. And I say that because I think that that's um, the area where there is already perhaps the most um, focus on uh, assisting people who have particular challenges. And I think there is probably the, the tightest connection with those other um, uh, advocacy groups that might be um, representing the interests of people with disabilities. So I think it's it's the Department of Human Services that ought to be um, the energy for this, but it, it needs to build links in a Victorian context with, um, you know, the, uh, the building authority, with the planning authorities, um, and it needs to, um, through central government, really then build links 
with other states and into um, the government, into the national government. Looking at it from a building perspective, I mean, we had the Building Ministers Forum, which would have been a very useful connection point. That's now no longer convened. It's now the Senior Officers Forum that has taken that over. And I think that, you know, there's so, so that forum represents a very useful connection point with the building regulatory world on a national basis. But it's a question, I think, then of, you know, the Department of Human Services connecting with that with that point. I also think that there's a, a significant advantage if um, the relevant advocacy groups make contact with industry organisations. Um, I have a connection with the Australian Construction Industry Forum, which is an industry organisation representing a number of other organisations participating in the construction industry. And it has a tight connection with government, both state and federal and is interested in these types of issues. And so I think there's also um, value in building connections with those industry organisations so that you know, you're know you getting multiple connection points with those who are making the decisions. Um, and um, uh, Owen's comments about you know, the financial impact of uncertainty uh, would be something which would be of significant interest to those industry organisations to you know, pr protect their members from the the, uh, the unfortunate financial consequences that can flow if there is non-compliant work. Thanks, Philip. Um, so we've got quite a few questions come in. We'll try to get to them all. That's great. Um, Vital, I might direct this one to you. It's from Alan. Um, and Alan notes that we hear a lot about climate change sort of radically change the way we teach design. <clears throat> and his question is, is education doing enough to embed issues of accessibility and disability in the built environment curriculum. So I might expand that a little bit and ask you to, to give your opinion on whether, how well do you think architects, builders, engineers really understand issues around disability such that they can sort of, you know, um, you know accommodate that within their, within their professions? Yeah, um, that's a good question, um, Alan, and thanks for that, um, Andrew. Um, now, firstly, to sort of, answer Alan's um, question. Um, I think um, there is, um, Alan is right there, there is not um, much education um, being um, sort of offered um, in built environment schools in related to um, design for um, for disability. Um, as, and as such, um, that is sort of um, flowing back um, into the industry where um, practitioners and um, student graduates go become practitioners and they, they are not sort of well informed. At the same time in saying that, um, because there is no sort of proper um, regulation around this um, in the National Construction Code, then um, it means there is no sort of um, a standing ground there um, for, for that to be taught. Um, and as you said in the open, Andrew, there is no sort of um, a clear definition of disability um, in the NCC. So um, it's not just about physical disability. There is the, the word itself flows, flows around a lot um, um, within the NCC, but clearly define what that disability means. It's, it's, it's sort of um, um, a missing. Um, moving down to the second question you asked, um, I think um, because of that impact from, from the um, non definition of disability, um, it means that um, 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 doing the design as it's required part of the NCC, it then becomes that um, engineers will over design um, buildings as um, Owen um, um, commented earlier on as well. So I think it's, it's, it would be, be great to sort of um, develop um, clarity around the sort of the goals of the NCC around um, housing for people with disability. And that definitely will then inform um, practitioners, um, builders, engineers, and, and, and architects as well. And as well, that will have a um, significant impact um, as well on, you know, the, the quality and cost of housing um, for these people with some disability. Did you want to make a comment there, Philip? I, I, I did, Andrew. Um, the, the question of education, I think, is also relevant to lawyers of particular interest to me. I mean, some people might be aware of the Chancery Lane project, which has now been underway for a little while, which is a pro bono project, a collection of lawyers from around the world who are preparing a suite of clauses to be inserted into relevant contracts to deal with um, climate change, global, global warming issues, so that there is available to lawyers a suite of standard clauses which will um, facilitate uh, contractual obligations in relation to addressing climate 
climate needs. And I think that there's an opportunity for the same type of exercise to get underway in relation to contracts which are relevant to the construction and the management, um, the maintenance of accommodation for people with disabilities. Um, and it, if, if there's someone um, who might be interested in that, they might look at the Chancery Lane website um, and make contact with the people who set up that project to see if a similar project could be set up to educate lawyers about um, changing the way in which they deal with accommodation issues in their contracts. Mm. Thanks, Philip. Um, could I read a question here from, from Simon, um, which I'm going to flick over to you, Owen, but Simon sort of notes that does the current research focus mainly on physical disabilities has the element of non-physical disability ever been a point of discussion in terms of the accommodation? And the answer to that is definitely yes, Simon. So the um, the focus, such as it is in the National Construction Code, is primarily around physical disabilities. But, of course, we know that um, neurodiversity, cognitive disability is the most rapidly growing area of disability in Australia. Um, it's a fascinating area from a design perspective. And so maybe, Owen... We'll throw it over to you in your sort of everyday life with your firm dealing with people with physical disabilities and dealing with people with neurodiversity and cognitive disabilities how does that play out as far as the regulations go sure well look most of our projects are people with cognitive impairment or uh, behavioral issues so um so it plays a very big part of what we do day to day and and as you said andrew the ncc is very much written around physical disability so um uh, simon there's a really good question because we don't have clarity over that so when you've got specific requirements in the NCC, let's say for fire evacuation, um, you know, how does that work with someone with a cognitive impairment? And, and you know, is, is the standard which the NCC calls up written for someone with a cognitive impairment? And, and this, it's so complex there, and there's, uh, there's a lot of experts that would provide some very good input on that far more detail than I but there's a lack of clarity over what what we should do and that that that's uh, again a, a problem for someone who's designing a build a building um where you look at something you go well that's good you know it's good to have an accessible toilet in this class three building for someone in a wheelchair but no one in a wheelchair is going to live in this building it's for someone who has a cognitive impairment so is that then what we should be doing making the building um uh with a an as 1428.1 compliant toilet suite it, it I, i'm not professing to have the answer but i think it's a, a really important discussion we need to have yeah it's mm. it, as i said simon it's a it's a really interesting one about what does it mean to have people with disability living in a house if you're if you are physically disabled and can't get out quickly then clearly fire and and, and all those things are very important but if you're fully mobile but have a different type of disability, what does that mean? And so, yeah, it's a really it's a really interesting point. Um, there's a question from Alex, um, which I'm going to throw to everybody, I think. Um, so Alex is saying that it's complex web, of both barriers and levers. That's true. Um, and he's asking what would be the top three actions to level out these issues? So maybe I'll ask each of you to maybe nominate one action you think will go some way towards um, alleviating some of these issues. Um, Philip, do you want to start with us? Um, I think the, the the question of having a, a a body within government which sole purpose is to facilitate coordination between all of the other limbs of government and to connect with um, the private sector and interest groups um, so that there is the ready flow of appropriate um, high quality information and the ability to bring everyone together and so the jigsaw is assembled neatly. Um, I think the development of that particular body would be the single most significant thing that could be done. Mm. Um, Vital? Yeah, um, and I think in addition to what um, Philip just said, um, you know, providing um, an, alternate, an alternative class of um, classification of housing for people with disability, which I would think, um, you know, best suits in a class one, it's probably having a class one C um, um, as an addition to what we have um, in the existing um, NCC there. And that will, of course, will be informed um, through um, the senior ministers forum, which um, Philip mentioned, which then flows on to the ABCB, who is the, the, the board responsible for 
managing the NCC. And I think um, that would be one action I would think um, that would be deemed appropriate. And Owen? Andrew, thank you. Um, look, I, 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 I'm actually going to just echo what Philip said. Um, I think the one thing we need is a system or a process to figure this out and to channel, or to, to bring, not channel, bring together all the stakeholders of which there's many. And, and I think without that process, we, um, we, we might do some tactical things that could be really good, but we're not, not tackling this holistically. You know, I mentioned earlier, you know, we, we've got um, planning law, Philip talked about that as well. We've got tax law, we've got, we've got all this regulation, all of the different government bodies responsible for this regulation. We've got all these technical experts that need to have input into this process, you know, fire engineers, services engineers, architects. It, unless you've got a way of bringing all this together, it's going to be a very fraught exercise. And I think I think I, I like the idea of trying to have a, a holistic approach. And most importantly, the person with disability who's going to live in the property and what they want need to have a voice in this. And 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 my fear is that if you have a lot of government or technical bodies or or, or special interest group work together, the view of the person with disability might be lost. And I and I think we need a way to make all that, that come together to figure out what what are we actually creating here that the regulation then needs to support. I think that's what we're missing. And and now and I think that not losing that voice is the reason why I suggested it ought to come out of the Department of Human Services. Okay. Or or wherever it is, it, it shouldn't come out of the building world. It shouldn't come out of the planning world. It needs to come out of the, the, the where there is the focus on people the, with those challenges. The individuals, yeah. And and I feel like it's almost we need not only to have it come out of the government world either. I think I agree. Yeah. It's 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 the, it's this holistic view and creating a way for that to work which again there'll be people cleverer than me on figuring out how that works but i i guess i'm echoing what you say philip i, I really yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> that was a nice series of answers because especially the, the last bit because you've sort of encapsulated about three questions that uh, we've got on the side here that i'm looking at so i'll, I'll answer them um, with reference to your question so there's a question from daniel about the role of universal design um, as being a useful tool jesse has made a comment about it's one thing to have houses, but what happens when you step onto the street and what's your urban neighbourhood like and is that accessible? And so is, is there any point in having a fully accessible um, and a great house if, if the, the neighbourhood doesn't suit you as well? Um, and so I think the answer to both of those questions sort of been touched on by, by you, Philip and, and Owen, in that it's, it needs to be a suite of things. So, yes, universal design is an important aspect and people should... Uh, it should be uh, the go-to for designers. Yes, we need to think about not just building regulations, but also planning. So how do our streets work? You know, how do our stoplights work? All those kinds of things. And then finally, sort of comment, I think, from Peter around, you know, getting di voices of people with disability into the mix. So how do you maintain that? And I think, again, both of you guys sort of touched on that, the centrality of having people whose homes these will be actually part of the decision-making process and, and, and part of establishing the culture around which we, we try and build in, in this, in this um, particular sector. Um, so I hope that, that helped with um, Jess and, and Daniel and um, thing. Andrew, Andrew, can I just make a comment? It's just occurred to me, if we look at how the community, how government and the community reacted to COVID um, and the way in which um, a lot of barriers were put to one side and people just focused on what needed to be done to achieve solutions um, and and did it very quickly uh, because the perceived need was there. A, a similar kind of energy and cooperation ought to be brought to this issue. And, and um, we should take inspiration and comfort from the fact that we could do we could do things a little differently during COVID and we could bring about different outcomes that we needed to bring about because of necessity there. Let's mm -hmm. just bring the same attitude and energy to this issue. I absolutely agree. Okay. I mean, um, Andrew, I was just going to say in addition to what yep. you said earlier on, um, I mean, I'm looking at um, some of the, the, the 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 features coming in the next division of the NCC um, next year, um, where we they're trying to put in um, some of the minimum standard for um, 
um, accessible um, ac accessibility into housing. I think um, that's um, that's that's great. Looking at uh, you know the the, the stepless um, entry in and out um, of the house, um, looking at um, um, step free shower and and the likes. And I think um, that's a good starting point. Um, in addition to what um, Andrew and um, um, Owen and Philip and were saying there, because that will sort of um, help. Um, transition of people with disability, physical disability, I mean, in that case, um, you know, allowing ease of movement um, um, in and out of um, housing and accessibility within the house itself. And I think that um, provides them um, sort of um, some form of independence for people with disability and a beginning of, of things to make um, um, regulation a bit more equitable and, and fair, if you'd like. Excellent. Um, so I think we're nearly out of time. We're just about at the 55 minute mark. So I'd like to, to thank everyone who is out in the audience and really um, thanks very much for the questions. Really, really great for us um, to, to um, you know, get feedback and to, to get questions from you guys. Um, and I hope that we will see um, a fair amount of you uh, over the next couple of days. I think we have six roundtable sessions uh, which are designed to be, uh, you know, a, a small group of between five and ten people where we can, again, sort of open up and discuss various issues from different sort of perspectives that we'll try and take those um, those insights that come out of those sessions and, and then integrate those into the sort of final report for our particular um for our particular uh, project. So with that, I think we can uh, send it back to Karen, I think. Thank you so much to Andrew, Vidal, Philip and Owen. Certainly a very complex uh, landscape to be navigating uh, when you're looking at trying to provide relevant housing to uh, those in the uh, who are living with disability. So a really cracking discussion there about um, the real challenges uh, ahead for so many when trying to ensure that uh, you're meeting the various state and federal obligations, but also putting uh, the, the needs of those who are going to be using those houses at the forefront. So a really interesting discussion there. So thank you so much uh, for, uh, for that great discussion, gentlemen. So we're about to do that magic jump again over to our next session, and that's uh, a panel conversation about economic insights into affordable housing. So once again, if you have any technology problems, uh, find our event support staff, but you should just be transferred over. It's actually, we're running a little early, which is always nice. Uh, so much better than running late. So that will be starting at two o'clock. So you've got a few minutes, you might be able to get away and just have a, a quick ablutions break if you need to or grab a cup of tea, coffee or whatever. So I'm going to see you at two o'clock.